tired of cable chaos and your entertainment center? Frustrated with endless plugs and sockets? Say goodbye to the mess and confusion. Introducing SCART, the ultimate solution to simplify your audio and video connections. With SCART, you can connect your VCR, Laserdisc, and set-top box to your TV simultaneously with one connection, delivering a crystal clear picture. No technical expertise required. Just plug, play, sit back, and enjoy your entertainment hassle-free. But that's not all. The SCART connector is designed to withstand the test of time. Its durable construction ensures that it will keep your entertainment center tidy and organized for years to come. Order now, just $9.99 for one SCART cable. Order in the next 15 minutes and we'll throw in an additional 999 cables. That's a thousand cables for just $9.99. Call today. SCART may not have been quite that good, but when it launched in the 1970s, it was a genuine game changer. Up until then, most TVs didn't have any inputs. The only connector on the back was an aerial socket to give better reception for broadcast TV. SCART launched at just the right time to support the growing use of VCRs and set-top boxes, allowing one simple connection to transfer high-quality audio and video. The non-standard shape meant it was impossible to connect it the wrong way, something that you couldn't say for standards like USB that launched 20 years later. By sending control information along the same wire, it was future-proofed until digital TV came along in the 1990s and survived into the millennium. Yes, it was a bulky connector, but a bulky connector that just worked. Cheap cables damaged its reputation with a shoddy video experience, but in its heyday, SCART could deliver high-definition 1080p component video with surround sound, something that would only become everyday with Blu-ray players in the 2000s. SCART is named after the organization that created it in the 1970s, the Syndicat des Constructeurs de Paillets Radio Récepteurs et Télévisieurs, the French Radio and Television Receiver Manufacturers Association. But in France, it's known as Peritel or Peritelévision. Before SCART, in Europe at least, early audio and video devices used a variety of connections, RCA jacks, DIN, the SO239 connector, or even BNC, the jack that was used for networking in the 1990s. They were all decent connectors, but different connectors meant conversion cables needed to be used. SCART swept all of this away. It appeared on devices in 1977 and became a French standard in 1980. It spread across Europe, appearing on TVs, set-top boxes, VCRs, and eventually DVD players, all manner of things, in fact, that needed to connect to a TV. From day one, it supported both composite and component video. Component video was much higher quality, splitting out the three color parts of the signal, and much higher quality than most customers were used to in a day when you were lucky to have a 30-inch TV. SCART also included control wires that allowed remote devices like the VCR to power on the TV from standby. It would also automatically switch the audio video output to the correct channel. So, for example, if a user inserted a pre-recorded video cassette, the VCR could power on the TV and start playing the content with the TV on the correct channel. That's a great thing for people who struggle changing TV inputs, a problem that remains to this day. SCART aimed to solve this problem, and Sky's UK set-top boxes used it to great effect. In the 1960s, the TV set didn't have anything connected to it. By the 1970s, video games machines were using the aerial socket, requiring splitters which degraded the signal. By the 1980s, this had expanded to VCRs and set-top boxes that decoded satellite and over-the-air broadcasts such as France's Canal Plus. SCART included the ability to daisy-chain devices together with the TV at the end. This allowed the VCR to record the decoded video. On the way to the TV, the SCART connector allowed the correct audio language to be chosen. As DVD players became popular in the 1990s, these could also be added to the chain. The video signal didn't have to go one way either. SCART allowed the audio and composite video signal to be bi-directional. The Canal Plus set-top box used this feature, so the TV would receive the signal and pass it through the SCART cable to the set-top box, which would decode it and then send it back to the TV. SCART allowed for two types of video input switching, a slow and a fast method. The slow method is probably what you're familiar with, switching from one source to another. 
the fast method of video switching was a lot smarter. The video signal could be switched at the pixel level, allowing devices to interleave subtitles or overlay teletext information over the top of a regular picture with the help of teletext transparent color. Again, SCART's ability to send bi-directional audio and video meant a teletext decoder or subtitle box could take the signal from the TV, mix in subtitles or teletext at the pixel level, and send the altered video back to the TV. SCART also had a pin to send serial data in a manner similar to USB. The format of the data wasn't defined, which led to some very creative implementations. Some satellite set-top boxes used it to send data about the satellite's position in the sky to boxes that controlled the dish. Some devices used it to transfer stored channels or other settings between compatible devices. Philips created a multi-master command protocol in the 1970s, an early form of home automation. Another protocol, AV-Link, allowed for remote control of devices and negotiating video signal types. AV-Link would be carried forward to work through HDMI. The data pins were also used to send Dolby Pro Logic or other surround sound information between devices, but it wasn't widely used. This lack of a standard way of dealing with surround sound meant customers had to send audio separately with RCA cables. This negated many of the advantages of SCART as the audio didn't switch when SCART automatically changed the video source. The SCART committee continued to adapt the standard to a changing world. S-Video was superior to composite video and gained popularity in the 1980s. The SCART standard was extended to support S-Video, meaning that while some countries used new S-Video cables for compatible devices, SCART customers could continue using the same cable to get improved video. One downside was it couldn't be automatically detected, meaning users had to set it manually. It's important to say here that S-Video was inferior to component video that SCART already supported, but more devices supported S-Video than component, presumably because it cost less to support. The 1990s bought widescreen TV and DVD players. SCART was extended to support automatic switching to widescreen to maintain the correct aspect ratio. Another option was the support of pan and scan, where the most important part of a widescreen image was shown on an old 4x3 TV. SCART helped through this transition to widescreen, but despite this, the world of the late 1990s and early 2000s was blighted with TV screens showing stretched people, and I can't have been the only person who found this immensely frustrating. The original SCART standard was limited to a resolution of 800 by 600, but subsequent iterations in the 1990s pushed that to up to 1250 lines of video data. This meant component video could support 720p, 1080i, and 1080p, meaning SCART could showcase high definition video. Admittedly, that was mainly limited to some technology demonstrations like HD LaserDisc shown here in a video from Techmoan and linked above. HD LaserDisc never took off. Video files were still using regular old LaserDiscs with just 425 lines of resolution. When DVD came along in the late 1990s, it wasn't much better at 480 lines. But SCART was ready in the 1990s in case high definition content became available for an affordable price. Many DVD players supported component output through the SCART socket, but set the default to composite. Some customers didn't realize they could get a better picture by making a settings change, and this could leave an impression that SCART didn't deliver a good DVD picture. This was further hampered by low quality SCART cables. Not all pins were wired up, meaning only composite video was supported and daisy chaining didn't work. And although it was recommended that each audio and video wire had its own coaxial shielding, many scrimped with cheap wires leading to crosstalk, which led to ghosting on the video, even on short cables. All of this wasn't obvious for consumers. A SCART cable was a SCART cable, right? But high quality cables could deliver an excellent image over several meters and could be made longer by amplifying the signal. There were more serious problems as well, with 12 volts going through the cable, swapping the cable when the devices were switched on opened up the possibility of frying one of the devices if the cable wasn't connected properly, although the cable design was of course designed to make this as hard to do as possible. 
If the cable was connected to a powered TV with the other end unplugged, the large exposed shield on the SCART connector would be held at approximately half mains voltage. If the cable is then plugged into an earth device with a metal case, inadvertent contact with the SCART cable shield while the earth device is touched with the other hand could result in a painful electric shock. Ensuring the TV is off and connected last would prevent all of this from happening. Japan and Korea also use the SCART connector and it's commonly known as RGB21 or JP21. While it used the same connector, of course some bright spark didn't make it pin compatible with the SCART standard. One of the few pins that matched with SCART was the red RGB pin, so one way of spotting a SCART RGB21 mismatch is red component video. It was also expanded to support S-Video in the 1990s, but RGB21 never caught on like it did in Europe. If the SCART socket was rare in Japan and Korea, it was even rarer in the USA, but it was a thing. The SCART protocol was turned into a US standard by the American Electronic Industries Alliance as the EIA multiport, but adoption was almost non-existent without any government or industry push behind it. That's probably why SCART never appeared on the back of games consoles that were designed for a worldwide audience. SCART was always rooted in the analog world, so when digital audio and video came along in the form of DVD and digital video, the writing was on the wall. Besides, the socket was far too big for many smaller devices, using chunky cables which made it hard for home theatre setups that were installed in tight spaces. What's more, it hadn't become a standard in the large North American and Far East markets. New standards such as DisplayPort and then HDMI took over, offering many of the same features but with a higher quality digital signal that also provided copy protection features that content producers demanded. Requirements that devices support SCART were dropped in favour of HDMI, SCART to HDMI converters appeared, and SCART was consigned to history. Poor quality cables damaged SCART's image, but there weren't clear standards to show a level of quality like USB tried to do by colour coding faster USB 3 sockets and cables. There wasn't the ability to handshake between devices to negotiate the highest video quality, meaning many customers got stuck watching composite video. And that connector was just way too big. But these are minor problems. The standard was after all developed in the 1970s when DVDs were just a pipe dream. It was a very forward-thinking standard which, when implemented correctly, allowed several devices to work seamlessly together with crystal clear high definition video. If you've ever wondered what those three letters are on the back of a CD, there's a video about that on the right as well as one about the history of the telex when people texted using machine the size of a piano. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.